he and his partners changed the face of the management of orthopedic trauma here when he came here. Um, he recruited other people that have continued that. They, they look at it uh, really intensely from a clinical standpoint, but have also uh, gotten involved in a lot of research that deals with orthopedic and uh, multi-system trauma. So, Pete, we're happy to, that you're here. He's given this talk a couple times before, but it's one of those things that he and I were talking about that will always be here. No matter if we got rid of gunshot wounds, we'd still have pelvic ring disruptions from car accidents or uh, uh, logging accidents or whatever. So look forward to it. Thank okay. you for being here. Thank you for inviting me, Dr. Zachary. Uh, yeah, this uh, this is an old slide from my fellowship, and uh, uh, this this patient didn't make it, but uh, guts in a bag and a external fixator and traction and all that. So uh, like Dr. Burns said, the, the, the incidence of pelvic ring disruptions is not decreasing. It's increasing our operative uh, uh, cases uh, here at Erlanger increase every year and the unstable patients uh, need special attention and that's what this review is going to be about. So we're going to talk a little bit about the anatomy and biomechanics of uh, the, the pelvic ring, some demographics, uh, go over clinical and radiographic assessment and I won't bore you too much with uh, classifications. We'll just discuss one of them, the one that's the workhorse. And lots of time on uh, the different modalities for uh, hemorrhage control and associated urologic and open pelvic fractures. I do want to mention I do have some disclosures, but none are relevant to this talk. So it's pretty simple. Three bones of the pelvic ring. That doesn't look too complicated. With that, though, there's no inherent bony stability. The stability comes from the uh, pelvic uh, ligamentous structures. That's the key. The uh, anterior and posterior sacroiliac joint ligaments, the anterior here and posterior here. The pubic symphysis uh, cartilage uh, down low there in the front. And then the pelvic floor ligaments, the sacro, uh, sacrospinous ligaments and the sacrotuberous ligaments. So we get rotational stability uh, from the, of the pelvis from the pubic symphysis and the anterior sacroiliac joint ligaments and the sacrospinous ligaments. These are really tough and really dense and strong ligaments. Vertical stability when the pelvis uh, might be rendered to an uh, asymmetric axial load uh, force vector, uh, the stability is uh, uh, maintained by the posterior sacroiliac joint ligaments that are known to be the strongest ligaments in the body and the sacrotuberous ligaments. A little bit about demographics, uh, pelvic fractures for all comers, I mean, compared to distal radius fractures and geriatric hip fractures and, and everything, 3% uh, of all fractures. Uh, unstable fractures, mechanically unstable fractures, is about 15% of all comers with a pelvic fracture. So we certainly see a lot of pelvic fractures here at Erlanger, but the majority of them uh, are, are mechanically and, of course, hemodynamically stable and don't require treatment. Multiple series through the uh, 80s and 90s here show that 15% uh, incidence of hemodynamic instability in pelvic fractures. And so that's where we'll, you know, People can die from pelvic fractures, from, from, uh, from hemorrhagic shock and, and, and late sepsis and multi-organ system failure issues, but the bad actors are the ones who present with uh, hypotension on admission. Um, a patient who comes in with an unstable pelvic fracture uh, with normal blood pressure, only 3% mortality. But this series here out of, uh, uh, because it was a New Orleans charity back in the 80s, when they came in hypotensive, 42% mortality. And then uh, a series from uh, Pitt uh, in Pittsburgh, Barry Reamer's group, 6% uh, mortality in all comers and 21% uh, mortality in, uh, in hypotensive patients. So these are the ones that we really need to, to, to hone in on and work as a multidisciplinary team. Associated injuries are important. Patients, uh, hemodynamically unstable, mechanically unstable pelvic fracture and a, and a surgical head injury needs a crany, 50% mortality. Uh, hemoperitoneum, exploratory laparotomy, unstable pelvis, hypotensive, 50% mortality. And all three, a craniotomy and an x lap and an unstable pelvis is a pretty, pretty morbid actor. Age and Associated injury is important. We all know the 
the, the uh, small lick on a healthy young patient can be a big lick on a geriatric patient. So when we add age and ISS together, this threshold of 70 seems to impart a dramatic change in the mortality. We're doing a little better uh, probably uh, here 20 years later, but these are st sobering statistics. An old, older person with high energy trauma, unstable pelvis, high ISS, uh, they're going to be hard, hard saves. So <clears throat> you all know this. This is ATLS here, uh, evaluation of hypotension in a blunt trauma patient. Uh, we're going to do the trauma ABCs. You want to determine that cause of hypotension and determine that source of hemorrhage. And it's rare, but sometimes it happens. Cardiogenic shock, spinal shock, but you have to prove out hemorrhagic shock is the cause of the hypotension in the blunt trauma patient, and that's the main reason. You know where to look. You're in the chest, chest x-rays and, and putting chest tubes in if it's a big hemothorax. Abdominal uh, assessment is uh, typically, I guess this day is now in our emergency room, is the uh, FAST scan, diagnostic peritoneal lavages and, and, and rapid CT, uh, if they're stable enough to get them to the CT scanner. On uh, the retroperitoneal space uh, where <coughs> pelvic fractures can bleed and, uh, and, and, and pool the blood loss uh, can be detected by physical exam an unstable pelvic fracture, and certainly the x-rays that we'll get to. Remember patients, multiple long bone, patient, multiple long bone fracture patients can uh, have significant hemorrhage, and the external wounds uh, have to be, have to be uh, tamponaded and sutured and, and, and treated. So in a pelvic fracture, where does the blood come from? It's uh, three sources, the cancellous bony bleeding, the retroperitoneal venous uh, structures is complex anterior and posterior divisions of the internal iliac system. And pelvic arterial bleeding, we do a, a fair number of angiograms on these patients. But in all comers, this study from Bruce Browner when he was down in, uh, when he was down in uh, uh, Houston a uh, number of years ago, he consecutively angiogrammed every comer with a pelvic fracture. And, uh, it was only about a 10, 10 to 20 percent positive yield, so you have to be uh, selective. And fortunately, we don't have uh, common il iliac or external iliac uh, vessel injuries very frequently. On the clinical exam, this is a patient arrives uh, in the trauma bay, and uh, may may maybe we won't see this anymore, an open book pelvic fracture with the legs so splayed apart because I think our uh, advanced uh, care EMS providers and helicopter pilots are probably recognizing this as a potentially unstable pelvic fracture and tape the legs together in internal rotation and maybe even putting the binder on in that uh, prior to ambulance transfer. But uh, the physical exam findings of hypotension and blunt trauma patient alone should make you think about a pelvic fracture. When you see these rotational or limb length deformities, abnormal motion on mechanical testing, one, one, one check, and after you feel that lateral compression that those pelvic wings crunch and grind and move in space, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, very important. And probably an interesting exam finding that the med students, we want to show them what that feels like, but too many exams to break up those clots is not a very good idea in an unstable patient. Look for, for uh, wounds. Uh, and hematomas in and around the genitals and uh, uh, sacral region, and uh, be, be very diligent about checking all the orifices for, for hemorrhage. <clears throat> the AP pelvis radiograph still remains on the, uh, the ATLS uh, screening uh, protocol for blunt trauma patient. And fortunately, it's a very accurate tool. An AP pelvis x-ray in 90% of the cases is going to uh, point you toward uh, whether you have or, or don't have a potentially significant pelvic ring disruption. So these are important. These are the x-ray findings here. You want to look for back in the posterior pelvis. Note that this patient had bilateral. This is a right sacroiliac joint disruption. And then a left sacroiliac joint disruption traveling up through the iliac wing. So large fracture gaps and displacements at the sacrum, posterior sacroiliac region, and posterior ilium. Some more subtle findings are transverse process avulsions of the lower lumbar spine, and sometimes we'll see uh, bony ligamentous avulsions where those uh, important ligaments we discussed pull off the side of the sacrum. And when we see pubic symphyseal diastasis of greater than uh, an inch, uh, 2.5 centimeters, that's very clinically significant for a mechanically unstable pelvis. <clears throat> 
We'll get to other uh, uh, x-rays that we do, the inlet and outlet and CT scans. Uh, the inlet projection, you'll note how the beam is tilted. We see the pelvic inlet and this uh, uh, lets, lets you get a good look at the sacroiliac joints and whether the ilium may be posteriorly displaced. Note the right side of the injury compared to the left in the pubic symphysis uh, diastasis. The outlet radiograph, uh, we get a good look at the sacrum on the outlet radiograph and you'll often see fractures going through these neuroforamen and if they're displaced or gap more than five, 10 millimeters, that's significant. Again, here the SI joint and pubic symphysis diastasis. We want to get CT scans. They can go fast, and, 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 and that's up for, you know, maybe coffee or beers or craft beers with the uh, trauma attendings. I mean, when, when do you guys say somebody's too unstable to, to, to run real quickly through this, the high-speed CT scanner? Uh, but generally, I mean, if, if, they're, if, they're, if they're not stable, they shouldn't be going there. But when they stabilize, and we'll, we'll want to see what these, these posterior pelvic ring injuries, this, uh, this markedly uh, gapped sacral fracture is apparent on the CT scan, but can sometimes be hidden in obese patients with bowel gas and poor radiographs. And these are important for us to plan our definitive treatment. So the several classification schemes uh, are important. A classification is only useful if it helps guide treatment, and I think, I think uh, our workhorse does. It defines injury mechanisms, the pelvic stability, whether it's rotational or, uh, or vertical instability, predict the need for early intervention, and understand what kind of associated injuries go along with the, the particular pelvic patterns, pelvic fracture patterns. And the young Burgess classification indeed is our, is our workhorse. So we have first the lateral compression group, uh, the LC1, and this is a very, uh, there's variance and uh, spectrum of instability with this fracture. If posteriorly the fracture is incomplete sacral fracture and then anteriorly usually horizontal rami fractures without a lot of pelvic deformity, these are the ones that will sometimes uh, treat toe touch weight bearing, uh, if it's a complete sacral fracture and not, uh, not displaced. Uh, and these are actually the, mo the most common injuries, these lateral compression injuries. The LC2 pattern is a uh, fracture usually of the posterior ilium and the horizontal rami fractures. And this is, this is a mechanically unstable pelvis that we usually treat surgically. And then the LC3 injury is a sort of a rollover pelvis injury with a lateral compression on the left here, the sacrum, the, uh, the iliac fracture, and then as whatever rolls over the patient, the uh, sacroiliac joint ligaments on the opposite side spring, and then we can have a second anterior ring injury that opens up, so a rollover pelvis. And, uh, you know, these patients don't need nearly as much blood as some of the other higher energy pa uh, patterns. Uh, they, they have a, they, you know, when they, when they do die with multiple system injuries, the death is usually related to their head injuries that they have and other visceral injuries. The open book or AP compression groups, again, anatomically uh, have increasing uh, degrees of instability. The AP1 uh, is, is relatively rare. A pubic symphysis disruption and some minor strain to these pelvic floor ligaments. And if it, this is less than two and a half centimeters, we generally can treat them with weight bearing and non operative treatment. We don't see too many of those, though. Um, the AP2 injury is uh, a, a complete diastasis of the symphysis and rupture of the floor, uh, the pelvic, pelvic floor ligaments and the anterior sacroiliac joint. And then the AP. P3 injury is a complete disruption of the sacroiliac joint and hemipelvis. Uh, so this, this is both rotationally unstable and vertically unstable. And these are the patients that bleed. Uh, in uh, Dr. Burgess' series in shock trauma uh, 25 years ago or so, 15-unit uh, uh, transfusion requirement, 20% mortality. And the deaths here can be related indeed to the, to the hypotension from the pelvic fracture itself and associated visceral injuries, and then late uh, organ failure and ARDS. The vertical shear pattern are mechanically unstable fractures. These are the ones that will put uh, uh, in traction in addition to pelvic binders emergently. And um, they have 
can have significant uh, transfusion requirements and a, a very weird quirk in that series was 0% mortality. They didn't have many. And then there's kind of a wastebasket turn of combined mechanical injuries. We don't even know what the force vectors are. They're on the pelvis. Uh, it can be bilateral injuries in the back and acetabular fractures. So the LC, the APC, and the vertical shear injuries are the sort of the pathomechanics. Just some brief, uh, you know, the, 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 these are what we, the orthopedic surgeons, uh, uh, use as almost dogma. Uh, these, first, these first two lines here, a centimeter of posterior pelvic fracture gap or displacement of a sacral fracture, SI injury, a posterior iliac fracture, and two and a half centimeters of pubic symphysis diastasis usually defines a mechanically unstable pelvis that we're going to operate on. We have a newer uh, phenomenon that a lot of these lateral compression injuries can rebound and it's, uh, and their initial pelvis x-ray, they get hard on the side, you have pelvis will implode and then elastically recoil and the initial screening radiographs and CT scans might not look very impressive for any pelvic uh, 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 fracture displacement. So. This uh, Claude Sagi back in uh, back in, when he was down at Tampa uh, back getting close to 10 years ago, thought there were a number of these patients with these lateral compression injuries that uh, that indeed they don't look so bad radiographically, but if he they were very painful and hurt to try to mobilize without surgery, and if he took these LC1 and LC2 patients to surgery and did a fluoroscopic stress exam, pushing the iliac wings in or opening them up or putting an axial load on each femur to see if there was movement of the pelvic fractures. Uh, he, he, he's sort of the pioneer of this dynamic pelvic instability concept. And uh, if we had over a centimeter and less than two centimeters of anterior pelvic fracture displacement, uh, he initially recommended anterior pelvic fixation. And if you have greater than two centimeters of displacement, uh, recommended uh, surgical treatment. So this is uh, the dynamic pelvic instability. We have a case here. This is uh, this is a geriatric uh, high energy lateral compression T-bone. Thinks she had a pneumothorax and ribs and pretty innocuous pelvic ring radiograph on the AP screening X-ray. We see a sacral fracture here that may even be incomplete, but but it's not. It propagates through the SI joint out the ilium. So whenever we see a complete fracture through the anterior and dorsal uh, cortices of the posterior pelvis, we worry about this being a mechanically unstable injury. And so uh, in, in the operating room, you know, she lays there nice and symmetric and look at the degree of implosion with just a little bit of lateral compression. So. Uh, you know, we don't want her healing like that. That hurts a lot, and so then we, we do that stuff. Uh, pel geriatric pelvic fractures, just a little bit more. The, uh, again, more and more survivors uh, uh, with, with airbags, and, and uh, the patients coming in on, uh, on Eliquis and, and Zoralto and Coumadin and pacemakers and antidefibrillators. I can't believe these people are alive and driving, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> we, we all, we're all seeing them. And the lateral compression patterns are like five times more common than the open book uh, uh, pelvic injuries. We see the open book pelvic injuries in young patients with high energy mechanisms, but the lateral compression injuries happen a lot more prevalent in the elderly. And these LC patterns in elderly are four times uh, higher transfusion requirements than uh, the younger patients. And these severe, dramatic, high energy young people, AP3 injuries and lateral compression, LC3 patterns with the windswept pelvis and vertical shear fractures are not as common. Uh, maybe they just don't survive, I don't know. but. Uh, uh, and then the over the effect on on mortality, uh, the age on mortality. You know, uh, under 55, 6.2% mortality. Over 55, 20% in uh, in this series out of shock trauma. Now about 15 years ago. A little bit more on the demographics of how the geriatric patient uh, uh, fares with a blunt trauma and a, a pelvic fracture. The inpatient mortality is. Uh, is three times greater than patients uh, 65 and over compared to under. And no surprise down here, you know, pre-morbid status with a high uh, Charleston comorbidity index, that's one that we use for assessing how unhealthy a geriatric hip fracture patient is. And you probably know what the ASA scores, it was one through four. So 
these older patients have higher scores, and that seemed to be predictive of the inpatient mortality in a study just last year. So to get back, though, now to, to the, the nuts and bolts of managing a patient uh, who's hypotensive with an unstable pelvic fracture. So the classification is important, and if you remember anything out of this talk, it's the open book AP2 and 3 patterns, vertical shear and LC3 patterns are, are the ones that have increased transfusion requirements, increased need for angiography, and, and greater mortality. So our means of trying to help and save these people, uh, appropriate modern resuscitation and transfusion protocols, non-invasive pelvic stabilization, uh, either bed sheeting or pelvic binders, we'll get into that. There's still a role for anterior uh, pelvic external fixation. Uh, the posterior pelvic clamp will, will breathe through pretty quickly because it's uh, becoming a little obsolete. ORIF and then the roles of angiography and embolization and pelvic packing. And uh, still, we don't have any prospective randomized trials of uh, different protocols. There was a lot more debate 20 years ago about whether external fixators went before angiograms and the like, but uh, I think, uh, I think that, that has, might have been settled in the dust a bit. So, so you want to, in the early, you know, proper early uh, uh, transfusion and non-invasive stabilization, uh, you know, early transfusion, Pelvic binders, this is, this is an unstable pelvis put with a teapot binder, and you see the diastasis of the symphysis, it's corrected. A little traction on that left leg to pull that left uh, posterior iliac fracture down. And then uh, you want to correct uh, the coagulopathy and appropriate resuscitation for uh, correcting their acidosis and hypothermia and uh, complete uh, treatment of those other injuries, splinting and traction for for long bone fractures and uh, wound, external wound uh, management. Uh, I know your attendings will be a whole lot smarter on this stuff than I am, uh, you know, appropriate transfusion protocols. It's, it's just about 10 years ago that we started the one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one, uh, uh, transfusion protocol for similar uh, volumes of red cells, platelets, and, and FFP to, uh, to minimize coagulopathy that was, was shown to be effective and uh, better than just blood and blood alone and watching them still become coagulopathic and thrombocytopenic. And then the TEG scans, uh, I, I, uh, I haven't seen them since Chris Bell left. I haven't seen it quite so frequent, but I don't know if you all are still doing this, but this was a study a couple of years ago that uh, uh, in, in the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma about using the TEG to define, again, what you're going to transfuse. And uh, in this study, when they did a TEG-guided transfusion resuscitation, they, uh, they had much less uh, red cell unit transfusions than if they went immediately to the one-to-one-to-one. -to -one -to -one. And uh, I'm sure your, uh, uh, Dr. Maxwell might be able to comment more than, with his expertise on that kind of management. This is uh, what we and you look for to see if we're winning the game or we're getting ahead of the patient's uh, physiological decompensation. Is, uh, is their lactate coming down to below two, two, two and a half? We would like to see that base deficit uh, greater than minus uh, 2.5, adequate urine output and the vital signs stabilizing without, uh, without pressors and, 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 and ongoing massive fluid shifts. <clears throat> the non-invasive pelvic stabilization, these pelvic binders for the open book AP2 and 3 injuries uh, have been shown in a uh, really nice study from uh, UK uh, compared to without, but same otherwise medical co-management, transfusion and, uh, and resuscitation and fluids and the like. Uh, they had a reduced transfusion rate, hospital stay, and mortality when using pelvic binders for these open book fractures. So that's why, that's why it's now standard of care. Uh, internal rotation leg taping here. Uh, this is a, uh, I know our ortho residents are doing that. And then remember that we'll put the uh, distal femoral skeletal traction pins in to uh, bring down the hemipelvis on a vertically unstable fracture. If you don't have the binder, you have bed sheets. Okay, we've got linen closets everywhere and I uh, just need a couple of towel clips as well. Uh, it's not a band it's a, or, and, a, and a knot. It's a broader surface area around the trochanters and up along the iliac, uh, iliac wings to try to increase the surface area of compression to bring the hemipelvis together. Uh, 
Um, it's easy to apply. You can do cutouts for the uh, uh, interventional radiologist to do angiograms and a uh, couple of mechanical studies, that, uh, biomechanical studies that show that it definitely decreases the pelvic volume. The anterior pelvic external fixator still remains a workhorse for us in orthopedic, uh, you know, the orthopedist with uh, uh, co-managing these patients with you. Uh, advantages relatively rapid application, definitely reduce the pelvic volume and increase the, the, the fracture stability, although it's not anywhere close to as strong and stable as, as a good reduction in internal fixation. So we want to induce that retroperitoneal uh, tamponade and protect the primary clot. Some of the problems with the X-Fix uh, is alone, it won't control the posterior pelvis very well. We have problems with the pin tract, uh, pin tracts that may later compromise our surgical incisions when they're healthy enough to have definitive repairs. Uh, if they have uh, iliac wing fractures going down into the sciatic buttress, uh, there's two places we can place these external fixator pins, up at the iliac crest or uh, the so-called Hanover pins where we have them going in from right above the hip joints uh, at the anterior inferior iliac spine, but if there's fracturing in those regions, that's a problem. And then a battle I fought and lost here in my when I, when I came 21 years ago, was uh, I was used to putting these external fixators on in the emergency room up at University of Maryland, and uh, uh, and and we we just couldn't pull it off here. We couldn't pull it off. I mean, you know, imagine keeping a sterile pelvic X fix down in R E R. You know, we can't even keep traction pins and traction beds uh, uh, ready to go. So, in most most places, the external fixators are put on in the operating room with uh, fluoroscopy as well. So, and they work. This uh, study uh, out of Pitt, Pittsburgh again, uh, hypotensive pelvic fractures with external fixators, 21% mortality, and they cut their mortality rate in half compared to uh, fractures treated uh, with resuscitation and without a binder, uh, albeit, because this is probably uh, prior to the, the use of the sheeting and binders. And another st study from the uh, from the 80s uh, that unstable fractures with external fixators had similar mortality to pelvic fractures so that were actually stable. So their interventions with external fixators can work. Posterior pelvic clamps uh, seem to make some good sense here. This is like a big giant ice tong that looks. Uh, it's a big giant uh, ice tong that. Uh, we put in through stab incisions uh, in the gluteal, gluteal regions to push the posterior pelvis together. It's like a giant uh, C clamp is what it's called. And uh, it's been, been uh, touted as to, you know, m much more stable and, uh, and, and, and rapid like an external fixator. I mean, this is a pretty dramatic reduction here of this sacroiliac joint here with these two, two pins. And this was all the rave. Uh, and some, some really good results in the, in the uh, mid to late 90s um, on using uh, this in really unstable patients, high ISS patients uh, with unstable pelvic fractures and hypotension and, 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 and good physiological response of improved blood pressures and uh, reduced transfusion requirements. However, there's some real problems and it's, uh, it, it, it's become a bit obsolete. These pins, these ice Prong, these ice tong pins going in uh, can, can perforate the iliac wing. They can be sent through the greater sciatic notch into the pelvis, uh, the true pelvis, and damage uh, the organs in the true pelvis. They really have to be put on with uh, fluoroscopy in the operating room and their difficulty with uh, fracture comminution and obesity. We have a pelvic C clamp here, and it's sterile but uh, rarely used. ORIF is our most stable means of, uh, of uh, reducing and stabilizing pelvic fractures. Uh, the disadvantage is doing them too quick in a decompensated patient that's not appropriately resuscitated. There's been this fear of, uh, this fear of uh, decompressing the pelvic hematoma like some giant, uh, uh, giant devil cloud's gonna, the patient's gonna exsanguinate on you if you end up making a fan and steel incision to plate a pubic symphysis when they're when they're just right out of uh, right out of uh, two hours in the trauma bay and coming up and maybe not so stable. Um, other problems: infection. If uh, if uh, uh, incisions are made in damaged skin, 
uh, overlying uh, the bony injuries. So our solid indications for acute ORIF to still remain, however. Uh, pubic symphysis plating at time of laparotomy or uh, and, uh, for, for bladder repair, patient has an intraperitoneal bladder rupture, they're pretty stable. You all do a laparotomy and take care of the uh, uh, abdominal organ injuries and repair the bladder. Uh, if, if, if we're around, uh, that would be very reasonable to continue the incision a little further distal and plate the symphysis. And this, uh, this is one that we uh, uh, use frequently in the patients who we're bo both taking to the operating room, maybe somebody with a, uh, an open pelvic fracture, uh, very unstable, they need debridement uh, and or you're doing something in the chest and abdomen otherwise. Uh, if we get a little bit of physiologic stability and we're on our radiolucent operating table, we only need really about an hour to place these percutaneous posterior sacroiliac screws uh, as resuscitation screws. They may not be perfect, but if they're in the ballpark and control the posterior pelvic injury, I and my partners, I think we favor that technique over using that posterior pelvic clamp, but I think it's a bit safer. So here's a similar case, a case study. This was a, a Harley, Harley lady uh, driving a motorcycle and uh, uh, wreck and hypotensive, unstable pelvic fracture. She got her pelvic binder. You, you know, this, this is the CT scout. It's a good, a good AP pelvis x-ray because the portable couldn't burn through her very well. But uh, put, putting the binder on, you know, we get, we get her down a little bit. And, some ICU warming and resuscitation. She also had open fractures of her lower extremities. So a couple hours in the ICU, and then we, she's uh, doing a bit better. Uh, lactic acid and base deficit and urinary output are going in our right direction. And uh, we, we can do this work in probably about an hour and a half in, in the operating room. And so this, this wicked sacral fracture and uh, her open lower extremity fractures and anterior X fix and SI screws. So these are the resuscitation screws. <clears throat> Some older results uh, here. Uh, uh, this was this was general surgeons up at uh, uh, Brooklyn Kings County. They didn't have very good orthopedic support, so the trauma surgeons uh, decided they're going to learn how to put plates and screws in the pelvic fractures. And they, unfortunately, they had a lot, a pretty high infection rate. But done even early, I mean, early is less than 72 hours. But but sick patients, uh, ISS of 41. Uh, in fact, you know, a relatively high infection rate is concerning. Uh, Chip Rowd, who's probably our, uh, uh, our North American icon godfather now for pelvic fracture uh, treatment and, sur and surgery. Uh, 36 cases uh, done in the first 24 hours, low infection rate, acceptable mortality rate. And then a study from, uh, uh, this was Vancouver, uh, 32 of their 38 cases done early in uh, in, in less than 24 hours, 50% are, are hypotensive. So these are sick patients with unstable pelvic fractures. And look at that low mortality rate. So if we can get them physiologically trending in the right direction, I think getting, getting them up to the operating room for an hour and a half of work is really the way to go here. Angiography and embolization is a workhorse and, and very important uh, uh, tool for us. Some of the indications, uh, classically, four-unit transfusion requirement in 24 hours or six and 48. Uh, patient with a pelvic fracture, persistent hypotension with a negative ultrasound scan or, uh, you know, no hemoperitoneum on, on, on whatever modality CT scan. Patient who gets concurrently operated upon uh, you all for a laparotomy and see a hematoma, uh, retrocolic and retroperitoneal uh, hematomas and hypotension following binder or X fix, these are, these are the real indications. And, and, uh, and, and classic results from the 80s, uh, the radiologists say, you know, 80 to 90 percent they, uh, they can control hemorrhage. Still a high mortality rate, and one of the problems that we really have then with the orthopedic definitive management is if these radiologists do these non-selective angiogram embolizations where they'll throw coils and gel foam and just occlude the whole internal iliac uh, system and then these patients can can infarct their gluteal muscles and uh, and 
they already have bad skin and degloving type lesion. So we, we really would encourage the radiologists, the IR guys, to be selective and, and, and just, doing, uh, just doing the bleeding ve uh, branch vessels. Uh, so again, all comers, some of the disadvantages, all comers, it's only 10%, but we know what patients are going to have a high yield on an angiogram. Again, it's the, one, the mechanically unstable fractures who are hypertensive. Uh, so some problems are institutional uh, availability. We don't have that here, which is awesome. Our guy, the, 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 ask, the interventional radiology team seems to be there, Johnny on the spot, and are ready within 30 minutes in most cases. And the complications, again, the issues of gluteal necrosis and buttock skin necrosis on non-selective angiograms uh, are, are a problem, but we're trying to save lives here too. So who, who might benefit when we're looking at, at the patient in the emergency room um, uh, from, from, from an early and a quick embolization uh, and move toward that? Uh, we want to ide identify fractures with a high yield uh, potential of an arterial bleeding amenable to angiogram embolization. And what we'd want to see is a look at the contrast extravasation on the uh, contrast CT scan, the so-called CT blush. And uh, the, the Toronto group found this to be 80% sensitive and, and nearly 100% specific for identifying arterial bleeding requiring angio. So, uh, you all are very good at looking at this uh, and, and, and our orthopedic residents and, and attendings. We don't always just look at the bone windows. We'll, we'll put on the, uh, you know, want to contrast CT to see if we're, this, this uh, phenomenon is, is, is happening. So the, bleed, the bleeding source in these, uh, in these embolizations, or excuse me, in these uh, patients with pelvic arterial bleeders are the superior gluteal, internal pudendal, and internal iliac systems. So this angiogram, patient with a sick iliac joint disruption and symphysis injury, who's already had their, their external fixator place, they're still shocky, and their pelvis is sort of controlled mechanically the best that we can do at this point. You know, his angiogram uh, here shows uh, the uh, uh, first takeoff of the internal iliac. And uh, uh, that, that whole thing's probably gonna require a, a, a coiling and all. And just like the patients who are hemorrhaging, these open book patterns, the vertical shear and the LC3 patterns are the ones that if they're resistant to our resuscitation and binders, uh, get them to angio and we're going to have a very high yield uh, of a positive angio in these, in these, in these patients in this study out of uh, Parkland. Retroperitoneal packing uh, is, is discussed more in North America. Uh, came out of Europe in centers where they didn't have uh, angiography. Uh, and you know, there's a lot of tr uh, trauma centers in Germany and uh, uh, big centers, they don't have the big centers the way we, we, we do here in North America. And uh, so every, every hospital in every, every uh, German small town seems to say they're a trauma center and uh, they take care of these patients generally, but uh, this, this uh, without angiography, and they end up doing these uh, these pelvic packing. And patients who have to go to the surgery for a, a hemoperitoneum identified on a fast or CT or ultrasound, they need an exploratory laparotomy. This is this is what they're they're doing with a posterior C clamp or an external fixator, taking care of the abdominal organ injury and then getting low and packing packing in the uh, true pelvis. It's very important in uh, open pelvic fractures uh, where there's a large perineal wound and the floor of the pelvis is disrupted. We, to, to you know you got to put the you got to put the uh, uh, the bathtub plug back in the bathtub and so packing of those open pelvic fracture wounds is important. So the technique is, again, a pelvic clamp or an external fixator. A, uh, if you don't have to be up above the umbilicus for in organ injuries in the, in the abdomen, a low infra-umbilical laparotomy, and try not to open the peritoneum, and three packs to the left and three packs to the right in and around the bladder, and then remove and repack and stabilize the pelvis. And uh, uh, this, this out of uh, Germany, the largest trauma center in Germany, Hanover, Tim Pullman described that, uh, and, uh, and then uh, 
the group, the ortho trauma and uh, general surgery trauma group out of Denver General, uh, seems to be the uh, most vocal uh, supporters of this technique in North America. And so here's some, some results. Uh, very sick patients, extremists, you know, shock, pressors, fluids, blood, and high ISS, and uh, uh, they, this is a, a German study, and then uh, a uh, Denver General study by uh, uh, Catherine, uh, one of the trauma surgeons, 24 of 28 patients uh, with hypotension and pelvic fracture patients stabilized with X-fix and pelvic packing. And there was no deaths from pelvic hemorrhage. So this 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 paper got a lot of got a lot of street cred, and uh, and may indeed be 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 important if uh, you don't have rapid access to angiography. So we'll move into some of the associated injuries. The urologic injuries need to be identified appropriately because it's 15 to 20 percent in all pelvic fractures. Clinical signs down there in the emergency room: blood at the meatus high riding uh, a prostate on a welcome to Erlanger exam and uh, inability to pass, pass the Foley. So radiographically, we'll look for retrograde cystourethrograms and look on, uh, for uh, contrast uh, bladder extravasation on the CT, CT contrast. And we have an intraperitoneal bladder rupture. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. You, you all fix it. <laughs> and then we'll fix the anterior pelvis. Extraperitoneal bladder ruptures are a bit more uh, controversial and sometimes uh, result in clinical conflict maybe between teams. Uh, if indeed a, a retroperitoneal or extraperitoneal bladder rupture uh, can be treated with Foley diversion, if there's no significant pelvic fractures, it requires surgery in the anterior pelvis. But if, uh, if the pelvis needs us to fix it anteriorly for an anterior acetabular fracture or pubic symphyseal disruption where plates and screws are the best. We don't want, we don't want colonized uh, urine spilling all over those plates so we would really, really know, know that we're going to have a lower infection rate if those anterior uh, uh, extraperitoneal bladder ruptures are repaired. And um, suprapubic tubes are a problem for us, They're, they always end up with pusses, it's pus around them. It's like uh, tracheostomy tubes. You know what they always look like a few days later. And, the, and, and, and so us putting plates and screws in around, around suprapubic tubes and tracheostomies are, are, are shunned upon in this establishment. So we have urethral injuries. Uh, this is where, again, historically, the suprapubic tube placed and then delayed urethral reconstruction way down the road was the way a lot of urologists uh, wanted to treat these injuries. Uh, but uh, again, we've had a lot of problems with uh, infections with indwelling long-term suprapubic tubes when we put hardware in. So I know in my heart that a better strategy is, is an emergent temporary percutaneous suprapubic tube, you know, overnight and then early primary urethral realignment where the urologist will run, a, they'll run a line in over the suprapubic tube, maybe even with a positive negative magnet and then run a, 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 a cystoscope up the urethra and positive to negative magnets that they can connect them. Then they can run a large bore Foley over top of that to, to, to get a Foley catheter into the bladder or they'll do fiber optic coming in over the tube and fiber optic coming in with the cystoscope and kind of meet at the light. And uh, if that's done, that, uh, that's a lot safer for us to, uh, to, to do our thing with, with, with the metal to have uh, uh, metal fixation of the anterior pelvic injuries. Open pelvic fractures, the worst of the worst. And, and uh, uh, you know, we see probably in the order of about uh, four to eight of these a year here at Erlanger. Maybe, maybe not quite that high, maybe, 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 maybe about three to five or so, but this is a bad actor. So we, direct communication of the bony pelvic injury with the overlying skin, rectum or vagina. These are complex multi-system injuries with a bony pelvis fracture, pelvic organ injuries, and skin and soft tissue damage and very bad actor mechanically unstable pelvic fractures. 
And no surprise that they're high energy injuries compared to closed pelvic fractures. Uh, much greater transfusion requirements in an open pelvis, 16 versus 4 units in the first 24 hours, 29 versus 9 total during their admission, and open versus closed mechanically unstable pelvic fractures. And the incidence of the mechanically unstable patterns that we're going to have to put together and, 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 and do our surgical reduction and fixation is much higher. Uniformly associated with other injuries. And our definitive treatment of our skeletal injury is often difficult and compromised because of the logistics of so many balls in the air in these patients. Poor skin, urologic issues, neurologic issues, you know, sepsis and resuscitation issues. So these are tough. Uh, the organ injuries that they have, vascular damage of the internal iliac vessels, over 50% present in shock. Over 60% are angiopositive, so uh, that's, again, an important marker for who might be, be appropriately treated with an early angiogram. High incidence of neurologic and urologic and gynecologic and rectal injuries in these uh, uh, studies. This is one of our Erlanger specials from a few years ago. Make sure we don't miss these. You're not going to miss this, but uh, uh, you, might, you might miss a more subtle rectal tear or something like that. But the, all these wounds are often extensive, degloving and contaminated just because of their location. Crush injuries and, and, and degloving and necrotic fat, bad news. Perineal wounds always uh, contaminated. But we want to not miss the internal and occult open pelvic fractures, those who have rectal and vaginal lacerations. So we've got to be suspect and hypervigilant of all vaginal bleeding and uh, never chalk it up to the, to the menses for sure. It needs to be a woman has an unstable pelvic fracture and blood for the vagina. Um, somebody's got to have a good look, and I, th I, I think it's y'all. I don't know. Are y'all ever consulting gynecology? to come down now. So it's, so it's your, your speculum ex exam and me kind of looking over your shoulder when I'm there. <laughs> so. so I think this is useful. This is a Faringer uh, wound classification uh, uh, for, for these wounds in open pelvic fractures. And uh, this was a study out of one of your surger, surgery journals about 20-some uh, years ago. Zone 1, these perineal uh, perineal and perirectal and posterior sacral injuries are the most severe and worrisome. Uh, zone 2, medial thigh wounds and groin crease wounds. And then wounds that are remote from the perineum up at the iliac crest or posterolateral buttock are, are, are much, much less malignant and difficult to manage. the retroperitoneal uh, tamponade of closing them down with a bind or an external fixator or even definitive SI screws in a frame. Uh, and then the problem late, so, so they can continue to bleed despite our intervention. And um, then the late problems are late pelvic sepsis. So if they are able to survive their initial resuscitation, unfortunately a number of them end up with uh, late more organ failures and pelvic sepsis and, and die on a delayed basis. They're not common, fortunately. At least 45, if greater than 50% hypotensive and mechanically unstable fractures. And in various series, still up to 45% mortality in the, in, the largest re, in the largest recent series. Again, two phases of why they're such bad actors early exsanguination and late pelvic sepsis and multiple organ failure. Alan Jones, when he was at Parkland, uh, did a multi-center study and they made a classification, one, two, and three, stable pelvis, open wound, stable pelvis, no mortalities. Number two, unstable pelvis, wound out of the perineum or rectum, 33% mortality. Class three, the worst of the worst, the unstable pelvis with a rectal injury, 44% mortality and 77% pelvic sepsis uh, with, with, with modern strong treatment and experienced trauma center. So the management principles, good exam and 
make sure we don't miss the diagnosis of an open wound, resuscitation, control of exsanguination, emergent pelvic stabilization, debridements, early pelvic organ repair, uh, diverting colostomies for these uh, zone one uh, and rectal wounds, and delayed definitive internal fixation with secondary wound closures. So uh, a detailed, uh, the ATLS survey, detailed exam, classifying these wounds, uh, Farringer zone one, any blood, the rectum and that vagina requires further look with sigmoidoscopy and vaginal speculum. Right there, okay. Y'all are going to be doing it, but we, we need to, we, we're going to be ultimately in charge of the late and, to, and, and end outcome of these patients. So we, we need to be involved there too. And I, I think we are, so. Uh, same stuff as we talked about before. Appropriate resuscitation, binder, traction, anterior X fix, and then in the operating room, urgently, emergently, pelvic wound packing. If you see a vessel, makes sense to put a hemostat on it and a ligature. X fix, perk SI screws, and angio after the operation. So in the ER, binder, traction, OR, this is where you've got to put them up in lithotomy. That's not a good pelvic fracture to put in lithotomy in an unstable patient for, for, for dealing with a wound and looking at the rectum and vagina and all that stuff. So I would recommend that we, the orthopedist, spend hopefully less than 45 minutes uh, getting some control of the pelvis with an external fixator at minimum, maybe not these screws. And then after we have some mechanical stability of the pelvic ring, you, we can put the patient up in lithotomy for their, for their, uh, their, uh, uh, perineal washout and exp exploration. So we want to explore, extend, debride these open pelvic wounds that often have the bad degloved skin. Serial debridements of the zone one and two injuries without any thought of a primary wound closure. Uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, you know, uh, type three um, cephalosporin, recephin and maybe consider adding a, a flagell for, for anaerobic, uh, uh, better anaerobic coverage with a rectal or zone one wound. Antibiotic bead placement, uh, uh, vac packs and the like. Later, anorectal sphincter repair and colostomy with distal washout at the second IND, hopefully by 48 hours after. The urologic injuries are, 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 are treated very similar as I've discussed before. Again, we're not crazy about definitive suprapubic uh, tubes when we have to do anterior pelvic uh, internal fixation. So the role of the diverting colostomy comes into uh, question. Uh, Kimball Mall was a, a, a shock trauma attending from, from Arrows by going, I guess, Dr. Uh, uh, Burns, you knew Dr. Mall probably, and uh, he, he had it out there as dogma that, you know, these patients needed uh, colostomy, fecal diversion for all po uh, pelvic uh, wounds to decrease pelvic sepsis. And uh, don't forget to, to, to wash out the, 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 uh, the distal segment. This is a case of Dr. Barker's in mind, open lower extremity fractures, open pelvic fracture, mechanically unstable, X-fix. He did a really cool laparoscopic colostomy at 48 hours that I thought was awesome. And this, 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 this guy uh, fortunately ended up with a really good, a good outcome. So selective fecal dis diversion is, 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 is maybe a bit more appropriate. You know, if you have a wound at the iliac crest, they don't need a colostomy but certainly the zone one and rectal wounds do, and those bad actors, uh, the class three open fractures. And multiple studies up through the largest recent series uh, in, the, in the literature out of Grady, uh, that early colostomy works and reduces sepsis and death. Liberal use of anterior pelvic external fixator, uh, early percutaneous Iliosacral resuscitation screws uh, seems to be safe. We'll often place antibiotic beads in that uh, perineal wound and uh, ask for your assistance on the serial debridement enclosures and dealing with the rectal uh, sphincter uh, repairs and stuff. 
a limited anterior ORIF in these in these wounds. These uh, even treated stage the plating plating the symphysis. A, a safer course. Fortunately, this lady did fine, but maybe a safer course would have been just what we did there at the original operation. Uh, indeed, the Europeans, when they did uh, when they did definitive ORIF with open pelvic fractures, over 50% infection rate. So it's got to look really good on a delayed basis for me to want to put a pubic symphysis blade on. Uh, open acetabular fractures are fortunately rare. Uh, Usually secondary ORIF after serial debridements and, and, and physiologic stabilization, we want to isolate the colostomy and the perineum. Uh, I've treated five open acetabular fractures here at Erlanger in my 21 years, and uh, IND closure, antibiotics. Uh, we had one case of an iliac wound that we did a primary uh, ORIF at the initial debridement. All the others were groin wounds, uh, and the, the, the ORAFs were done delayed. This was a case of Dr. Mejia's of mine. This was a 18-year-old girl who uh, had a combined wicked acetabular fracture, a pubic symphysis disruption, and a vaginal laceration. And she got her binder and uh, 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 vaginal packing, and then a comeback, repeat debridement, and, uh, and uh, vaginal laceration repair. You see the air tracking uh, up along the internal pelvis, and she got heavy metal thunder when she looked uh, when she looked like she was uh, physiologically stable and didn't have any kind of infection profile. Had a nice result. Primary closure for zone two and three wounds without degloving is reasonable. Uh, early delayed closures after a second uh, debridement or third debridement at the time of ORIF. Secondary healing of zone one wounds after the sphincter repair. Sometimes they're actually all suture those up, but the, the, the wound breakdown rate can be pretty high. So if it can be treated with uh, VAC to healing is, is a, very reasonable, uh, a very reasonable option uh, uh, as uh, described in this European series. So this is the, the most recent series in the, in the literature, a large one from Grady, um, and uh, 44 open pelvic fractures, 45% mortality, 89% mortality with associated abdominal injuries. That's a very sobering statistic there. All the ones that had angiopositive open pelvic fractures died. And then if, if they didn't die from hemorrhagic shock, 69% uh, mortality when they got pelvic sepsis a few days to weeks later. Higher mortality in the zone one injuries and, uh, and, and, and higher mortality morbidity with open book patterns in a grade three open wound. Uh, this is Parkland's series, uh, 39 open pelvic fractures. This was with some other hospitals as well. Much improved, 26% 20, mortality. Their mortality increased with um, uh, bad pelvic fracture patterns, rectal tear, and there you go. There's the delay, the effect of uh, delaying a colostomy. Uh, if it was over 48 hours, three out of the four died, and uh, and only one out of five with it with it with an early colostomy uh, died. Another series out of um, out of Toronto with similar similar results. So some of the pitfalls here again in these open pelvic fractures are failure to diagnose the occult open fracture, failure to stabilize the mechanically unstable pelvis, failure to diagnose the rectal injury, and failure to perform diverting colostomy early. We're not going to do that to our patients because we're a good, strong, multidisciplinary team. We work together. Uh, anesthesia, interventional radiology, all of the algorithms tend to be controversial, you know, but some things have ferreted out that really do make a difference. You know, orthopedic, orthopedic uh, trauma attendings available early. Uh, the pelvic wrapping is a big deal. And uh, early C-clamp, and when they did that at this European center, they halved their uh, mortality. So some of our clinical guidelines, uh, at least from the OTA, uh, in, in, in dealing with a uh, blunt trauma patient with a bad pelvic fracture. We like to know if the abdomen's clear within 15 minutes. That's y'all doing a fast scan or high-speed CT scan if they're okay enough to get over there to the CT scanner. 
immediate binder placement and a high risk pattern, angio in 90 minutes, and then us getting them to the operating room within 24 hours to, to do some, some of our work, uh, X fix and resuscitation screws. And if we do that, we reduce the uh, transfusion requirements and most importantly, the mortality statistically significant in this study out of Europe. This is pretty complicated, but a, a, a good friend of mine and a, and a, and a, and a Texan can simpl simplify this. This is what we do. Fill them up, warm them up, wrap them up as a binder, squirt them up with the angiogram, and maybe we discuss a little bit about the uh, Reboa, the uh, internal aortic uh, balloon uh, device, which I, I did a little search for. I don't have anything in our orthopedic trauma literature about, and, and then fix them up. Chip Routes uh, hopefully going to survive his uh, lung cancer and continue practice down in Houston. So a case of ours uh, from a few years back during that 127 car pileup on uh, Georgia, every joint in his pelvis. So anyway, this is fun and we need to work together well to take care of these patients. Thank you. We have time for a quick comment. Dr. Dr. Maxwell, you want to speak or any other? I'm a surgeon, we don't have much time. Uh, great talk, Pete, uh, from one of the original uh, orthopedic uh, trauma breed. Uh, when the college came to inspect us, they're like, your trauma liaison from orthopedics doesn't, didn't graduate from a certified uh, orthopedic trauma program, and that was because they weren't certifying them yet. Uh, so uh, that was kind of funny when we had to explain that to him, uh, that he's got all this experience from way back, and uh, it's been great having him here. Uh, to I think one of the things that stands an orthopedic trauma surgeon out from a regular orthopedist is the uh, ability to manage these complex pelvic fractures, and some of the work that you do is pretty amazing. The anatomy and uh, the uh, large incisions that you make to get in there and do that stuff. Uh, a couple of comments, though. Uh, tag, yeah, we we do uh, still do some tags. Every level one and level two trauma gets a tag, and anybody with a moderate to severe uh, brain injury gets a tag with a platelet mapping. Now, there's a lot of interest in uh, trauma-induced coagulopathy. A lot of these patients will be coagulopathic before they get any crystalloid resuscitation. There's something about some patients that some intrinsic uh, brain injury. Uh, could be the brain injury, uh, all sorts of mediators are implicated in this and they're trying to sort it out. Uh, um, it, uh, the uh, pelvic packing thing uh, has been touted by Gene Moore. I, I just have never understood how a quaternary referral center like Denver General can't get its uh, uh, interventional radiologist to come in and do an angio on a trauma patient. I personally think they just like packing pelvises. Um, and, but to me, the definitive treatment is to put a coil in a bleeding artery in the pelvis. Putting packing on it, I think, uh, just is not as definitive. And I, I'm always worried that you get delayed bleeding for the venous soft tissue <clears throat> injury, sure, but uh, arterial bleeding to me needs a coil or a tie on it. Um, and then uh, finally, the, uh, it's almost like you abdicated um, the uh, trauma bay external fixator uh, after all these years of hearing that debated. I think the binder has is, is really supplanted that for the initial stabilization, uh, put the binder on it that controls all the soft tissue oozing and venous bleeding, uh, clamps the pelvic volume down and get them to angio for the embolization of the bleeding vessels, and thank goodness we have a very uh, dedicated interventional radiology uh, department. Our callback times for that are routinely less than 30 minutes when we call them to come in and embolize whatever. Do you think the Rabo is going to have a role? In, uh, some yeah, uh, we uh, really, really unstable. We, Consider that an indication. Somebody with a you know come in, their chest X-ray is negative, their fast is negative, and they've got a bad pelvic fracture and they're hemodynamically unstable. That would be a, a patient that we would consider for uh, zone three Reboa. Put the Reboa up, take them immediately to interventional radiology, and let. I think we've probably done at least one of those. Okay, so this is new stuff too. Yeah. yeah. 
And that's one of the real indications it's persisting with Reboa. When Reboa first hit the big time, you know, they were contemplating using it for all sorts of things. But a unstable, unstable, hemodynamically unstable pelvic fracture, I think, is a legitimate. We, we haven't. I, I did a little search. We, ha we don't have anything in print yet. You know, our, our orthopedic trauma, Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, or, or, or you know, uh, your green journal, Journal the, of Trauma and Critical. The AAST has a Reboa registry, and okay. they are taking uh, submissions from anybody who wants to contribute their patient uh, Reboa experience to it. So, and they usually have a, one Reboa paper on out of that registry every every meeting now. This was, <clears throat> was a great review, and I had a whole lot of notes that I'd taken based on my previous experience sometime back in trauma. But the one thing I want to emphasize, especially our residents, if you go somewhere to practice where you don't have the level of sophisticated orthopedist or urology that we have here. The suprapubic tube is really bad in pelvic fractures, or at least anterior disruptions. And uh, <clears throat> we had a real ti hard time for years in uh, getting our urologist away from it. It was sort of, it's an automatic. And so I was glad to hear you emphasize that as much as you did. And so I would encourage our residents, if you have a urologist that that you work with uh, down the road, the the brief percutaneous uh, may be good, but get them to some place where they can get them definitive Foley coverage. I uh, appreciate you uh, mentioning that because I've sure seen some personally some problems with that. Well, we're out of time. Great talk as always, Pete. Thank you very much okay. for doing this. Thank really you all. Appreciate you being here. <laughs>